All right. Welcome to the Life Plus God podcast. My name is Alyssa Robinson. I am your host, and I am here with the senior pastor of Treach Memorial United Methodist Church, Reverend Daniel Humbert. Hey, hey, good to be with you. It's good to be here with you, too. I have a little bit of a cough. I'm not sick anymore, I promise, (laughs) but I apologize in advance if you hear an ugly cough on this podcast recording. Nothing like it, right? Yeah. But uh, today we're answering a big question, yeah. or maybe not answering, but rolling around there you in go. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> a really big question, maybe one of the biggest questions mm. that I stumble across uh, in our faith. Is Jesus really the only way? The only way. And this is a question straight out of Google. Uh, this is something that <laughs> people that Google. I, people are regularly typing into Google and finding their way to our website. And I don't know uh, if there's if we've ever actually spelled out anything about this question uh, directly yeah. on our website. And so I just wanted us to face this question head on and and really pontificate on is Jesus really the only way? Yeah. I'm so grateful that you ask these kinds of questions. <laughs> are you, know, you really? You know I'm are so really? fond of them. They are some <laughs> of my favorite questions. I'm going to pretend you mean that. Yeah. Um, I'm glad you do. So first thing I want to start out with, I, I feel like there's some defining that we need to do mm. around what does the way mean? Um, because I think that this question like I said, is asked a lot, but we're all coming from a different perspective, from our own baggage, our own spiritual upbringing of what this could possibly mean. So to level set this conversation, could you tell me where do we get the idea of Jesus as the way in scripture and the way to what? Yeah, well, that's great. That's a good question. And there are a couple of places where this is how we get it. So one of them comes from the Gospel of John uh, in the 14th chapter, where Jesus literally says, I am the way and the truth and the life. That's chapter 14, verse 6. And the, the, the latter half of that same verse then goes on to say, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And so that's one way. The other way actually comes, at least the way I see it, is out of the book of Acts. And in the book of Acts, which is about the early church and kind of how the church got started, there are several passages, like seven or eight passages in in chapter 9 and 18 and 24 and a couple other chapters where the, the movement of those who follow Jesus are referred to as people of the way. And so in the book of Acts, this concept of the way is in reference to a group of people who follow a set of teachings by this guy named Jesus, who we claim. And so in John's gospel, he's referred to as the way. And then in the book of Acts, the concept of following his teachings is referred to as the way. So I think that's how people uh, start looking at it. Mm. So what are some different interpretations of Jesus is the way that you've heard, where they're taking that scripture and trying to define for us what that really means for our life today? And are there some positive interpretations that you've heard, and then on the other side, some negative that you don't really agree with. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, some of the ways I've heard it defined or described are Jesus is the way to salvation. Jesus is the way to heaven. Jesus is the way, the only way to faith. In other words, the only faith that can be real or true. Uh, Those are the primary ways I see it, and I kind of see those as a spectrum, right? So uh, sort of um, Jesus as the way to salvation or Jesus as the way to heaven is sort of on the front end of that. And then the the sort of far end of that is um, Jesus is the only way to any kind of faith or any way to connect with God. Do you agree with those? Well, so yes and no, right? I think there's a component of that that I clearly uh, believe, that is to say that Jesus is, um, when he refers to himself as the way and the truth and the life, a part of what I believe in faith is. So Jesus' teachings and Jesus' life and Jesus' ministry are a way to help us encounter God and that they are the, a way to make sure that we're doing what it is God wants us to do. Mm-hmm. And so... Uh, 
Jesus literally comes to save. We talked about that a few weeks ago when we were in Advent, and and so uh, I believe that Jesus saves, right? And so Jesus is a way to salvation. So I believe that. Um, do I believe it exclusively to the to the express uh, discontent of any other faith? I can't say that I believe that, mm. and I certainly can't say that I believe. Um, Jesus is the only way to heaven because that's a whole other conversation. Jesus himself spent very little time talking about heaven, what that means and why we go there and how we get there and what it is and all that kind of stuff, right? He spent his time talking about the kingdom of God here on earth and the ways in which he brought that. So to follow Jesus's teachings is not about uh, sort of reserving a place after we die. Mm -hmm. It's about living for him in this world. And that's what the the passages in the book of Acts are all about, right? If, if we're people of the way, this Jesus, then it's about how we live his love and his mercy and his grace and his forgiveness. So what does this mean for other world religions? So it, it sounds like we're not saying that they're wrong in the way that they're practicing their faith, but how does this idea of Jesus as the way uh, intersect with Buddhism and Hinduism and uh, Islam and, and these other big world religions? Yeah. For me personally, I answer that question in the context of that passage out of John chapter 14. And so I'm going to have to do a little bit of setup to, to, uh, that I think helps us a little bit. And that is, so John chapter 13 is about Jesus washing the disciples' feet and setting them a, a new commandment, right? That you'll, that you'll love others like I have loved you. And in the, at the very end of that chapter, he says a couple of times, once to the whole group and then once to Peter, hey, where I'm going, you can't go. And, you know, when you read it, you're like, well, what, what is he talking about? And uh, what Jesus is saying is, I, I'm going to go to the cross and I'm going to suffer and die. And he, he will eventually, of course, be raised from the dead, as we believe. That's what leads us into chapter 14, is he's just said this a couple of times to his faithful followers. And then chapter 14 starts this way. It says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my father's home if there were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? And when, when everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. And you know the way where I'm going. This is Jesus asking that question, right? And Thomas responds, no, I, I don't know, or we don't know, rather, Lord. He says, we have no idea where you're going, so how can we know the way. Thomas is a man after my own heart, by the right? way. Right, yeah. Jesus yeah. is like, you know this, right? And Thomas is like, no, I don't know. Right, I, right. Don't yeah. I don't that get it. I don't get it at me. all. <laughs> yeah. And he gets lots of condemnation for that, right? Because Thomas is the same guy who uh, doesn't see Jesus' hands and, and side a after the resurrection, and so mm -hmm. he gets kind of a bad rap. But so he speaks the truth, right? And then after that, after Thomas says, hey, uh, we don't know, how can we know the way? That's when Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. So Jesus is in the Gospel of John over and over taking a, a physical, tangible concept, in this case like directions or a way, right? Uh, in chapter 3, it was about being born again. In chapter 7, it was about water. In chapter 6, it was about bread. In chapter 9, it was about a blind guy. In every instance in John's Gospel, Jesus is taking something that's sort of physical and tangible and spiritualizing it. And so that's what he's doing here. He's, he's, he's trying to say without saying it, hey, I, I got to go to the cross. I got to suffer and die and do this for your sins and everybody else's sins. Um, and, and you can't go there. Peter, you can't go there. And Peter argued with him in chapter 13. Uh, and then he says it again in 14. And, and Thomas likewise says, I, I don't get it. Where are you going? And Jesus says, well, I, I am the way and the truth and the life. And part of what Jesus is saying is, this is about a relationship. This is about not only knowing me and knowing my teachings, but living for this way and this truth and this life. And a part of what I believe Jesus is saying is, uh, I am the way to a relationship with God, and I am the way to a relationship with love and mercy and forgiveness, and I am the truth that God loves you and that God wants a relationship with you, and I am the life. In John's gospel, man, everything is about the life that Jesus brings. I am the life that is full and abundant. So I say all that as a setup to answer your question, because you're thinking, well, I thought I answered a different question, right? I say all that because I think in relationship to other faiths, whether Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, or others, um, I think all Jesus is trying to acknowledge is, 
I am the way that helps you know this richness and this goodness. He, he is not saying, in my opinion, to the exclusion of any other way, to the exclusion of any other thing. He's just saying, I, I am the way that can help you discover this goodness that I've been teaching about. And again, remember, he has just said in chapter 13, I give you a new commandment. That commandment is to love people just like I have loved you, mm-hmm. right? And so that's his way. That's the way he's the truth. And so with regard to other faiths, I just say, man, uh, you know, I don't profess faith in Buddha, and I don't profess a faith in the multiple gods of Hindu, and I don't profess the Islam, Islamic faith. But a part of what we need to recognize is with regard to Islam and Judaism in particular, man, we have a whole history and, and, and deep connection with those two faith traditions in particular, and that we need to cherish and honor those, and that they have their own teachings about ways to God and ways to understand what salvation looks like. So in your studies uh, and your explorations, because you've probably explored other faiths to a greater extent than I have, only because it's part of the faith journey, I would think, of going through seminary and better understanding Christianity is better understanding where we came from, um, Judaism being right. a huge part of that. So have you seen, if we're, if we're not willing to say Jesus is the exclusive way, the only way, uh, have you seen other ways? Have you experienced other ways outside of Jesus? Well, so, golly, if we read the Hebrew Scriptures, what most of us call the Old Testament, uh, they would clearly tell you that the way to God, the way to righteousness, which is our goal, right? Righteousness is just a highfalutin term for being made right with God, being in right relationship with God. The Hebrew scriptures would say it's about following the law, and the better you can follow the law, the more righteous you are, and therefore the way in which you have found salvation. The the Hebrews would likewise say that the God of all creation, that is you and me and everybody else, including the Jews, the God of all creation set in motion for the Hebrew people a way of salvation through what we refer to now as the promised land, through the, I'm sorry, through the wilderness into the promised land. That, that they claim the faith of that salvation as their salvation. So, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a way there, right? The Muslim tradition would say uh, reliance on Allah and Allah's teaching, and Allah is simply an Aramaic word mm-hmm. for God, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's all that is. It's the exact same God that we profess faith in. And so they clearly have teachings in the Torah, in the... Um, uh, Quran. Thank you, Quran. Uh <laughs> To, uh, for, for them to follow, and their belief is highly similar to the Jewish faith, which is when you follow the, the, the Quran and its teachings, um, you will find salvation. Mm-hmm. So they have other ways, right? I got to say, I'm surprised by your answers. Um, I don't know if we've ever had a conversation like this before. We've addressed this as a church, but I fully expected you to say, yes, Jesus is the only way. Um, and I guess it, it's from my own baggage of uh, being preached to in a lot of different ways, saying you have to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior to get to salvation, to uh, be in relationship with God, with all of these things. And I guess it just felt like it's part of that Christian handbook of like, yes, Jesus is the one and only way. And it's just kind of throwing me for a loop (laughs) that that wasn't your answer. Yeah. Well, I I, I think um, in the Wesleyan tradition of understanding Scripture, we recognize that we take the totality of Scripture, right? We look at both the Old and the New Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures and the Christian Scriptures. And um, this passage in John chapter 14, I believe, has been misrepresented in a horrible way because it, it, made, it made the Christian faith seem off-putting to people who couldn't make the claim that Jesus is their Savior. And while clearly Jesus is my Savior, and while clearly I put my faith and trust in Him, and I happen to believe He is the best way, um, I I believe that um, what it means for Jesus to be the way, and certainly the way the book of Acts uh, renders it about people of the way, that it's really about how people, whether uh, so-called Christian or not, 
if they follow his teachings, and I know Buddhists who follow the teachings of Jesus, and there, you know, there's the famous quote from Mahatma Gandhi, who was a Hindu, who said, I, I would be a follower of Jesus if it weren't for his followers, right? Mm-hmm. And I think most people would, would, would agree that Mahatma Gandhi, in the way he lived his life and the way in which he shared unconditional love and mercy and justice with the world, was a follower of Jesus, not in name, but by followership, right? By teaching, if you will. And so I believe Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And I think anybody who follows his way, his way of unconditional love, his way of mercy and forgiveness, his way of speaking truth into power, his way of, of, of offering justice and mercy into the world, that anybody who follows that teaching, whether they have claimed him as a savior or not, is a follower of the way. And so um, maybe that's not traditional, but it's how I view it, and I believe it helps uh, I know it helps me personally, and I hope that it helps others to realize that I believe Jesus is the best way, and he's certainly the way for me. When it comes to belief in Jesus as Savior, does that have any bearing on the way, the truth, and the life, or are you considering that completely separate part? Well, so there are, excuse me, there are different ways to look at that. I mean, do I believe Jesus offers salvation? Absolutely. That he is a way to save us from our sins? Absolutely. Is that why he came? Yes. That, that's what, what we celebrate in Advent and Christmas, right, is, is uh, 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 his birth to bring that. So a part of what we see is that there are, and Wesleyan tradition uh, follows with this, we, we live a life of progression, in our faith and what, how we understand that. And a part of that is God's working on us and maybe even through us long before we profess Jesus as Lord and Savior of our lives. We call that um, uh, um, grace. I'm just Prevenient lost the word. Thank grace. you. Thanks for helping me today. Yeah, I'm Prevenient on it. Prevenient grace. See, <laughs> way to go. Prevenient grace. God is, God is loving us and uh, accepting us and moving in our hearts and lives long before we can claim Jesus as Savior. It's one of the reasons we baptize babies as Methodists. It's one of the reasons we believe uh, people can come and receive communion before they are members of the church or profess faith in Jesus. And then we have another part of that progression that is when I say and acknowledge head and heart-wise hey, I I believe in this guy, and I want to follow his teachings. We call that justifying grace, the the sort of moment or time frame or point at which I I actually acknowledge this and say I want to follow. And then what we call sanctifying grace is this whole rest of our life journey in faith with Jesus that helps us to know in our head and our heart that he really is the way, the truth, and the life. It's It's a progression, and it starts sometimes long before we profess faith in Jesus. Well, one of the questions that I had, because I expected you to answer differently, Mm -hmm. (laughs) was uh, what does this idea of the way that Jesus is the way mean for people who are never exposed to Jesus or people who have been mistreated by Christians? So you mentioned Gandhi, you know, my guess is that uh, he was not treated well by Christians and he saw Christians mistreat others. And yet we're supposed to be representatives of Christ when we claim that we are Christ followers. Um, Is it our responsibility to be spreading the way or are we... Okay. Yeah, pure and simple, yes. But if it's just one way, why is that part of it? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question, so let me uh, answer, and then you you say if that was the response or whatever. I'm not sure Uh, if I understand the question either. Yeah, so um, (laughs) we are called as followers of Jesus, in part— to share his love, to teach his ways, to to live as best we can in his stead. That is to say, do the things. That's what I meant earlier when I said when we follow the way, his way, mercy, forgiveness, kindness, justice, right? Um, That when we do that, both in spoken word and in action and behavior, that that's sharing his way, that that's being his way. And in so doing, that um, becomes sort of... um, 
captivating, I guess for lack of a better word, that people can be converted by those actions and or words, one or the other. But our goal as Christians is not so much to convert others, but to convey the way to them, right? Yeah. And so that's what we're called to. Another scripture I want to lift up that, that has been helpful to me that I, I can't say that I've always known by any stretch is out of First Timothy uh, chapter 2. And for me, this was helpful to sort of cross the bridge that you were unexpected uh, of my answers today. Uh, it's a couple of verses, and it says this. It's First Timothy 2, verses 3 to 6. It says, this is the right, I'm sorry, this is right, and it pleases God our Savior who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. There is one God and one mediator between God and humanity, the human Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a payment to set all people free. And so there's kind of two components there. I mean, there's clearly a little sub-phrase in there that basically says there's one mediator, right? There's mm-hmm. one, uh, one person who can help uh, make this possible. But then it's, those, it's the bookend phrases that God wants all people saved. And, and I tie that to, to creation. God made all people, whether they were followers of Jesus or not, God made all people. And God has this desire that all people might find this salvation. And salvation is a funny thing, and why I think people tie Jesus as the way to, to um, salvation and heaven, right, is they tie those two concepts together. And... Um, by golly, those two concepts are related, but they're not the same thing, right? I mean, what's fascinating about the word salvation, or, or to say the Greek word, is it, it really has this holistic component to it. It's, it's not just about a spiritual saving, it's also about a physical saving. Um, and there are several instances in the Gospels where Jesus offers saving to somebody, and their saving in these instances, is all sort of physically related. It's a blind guy who gets his sight. It's a woman who had a flow of blood who gets healed. It's a woman who was sinful, uh, and she finds salvation from her faith. And what's fascinating is uh, about half the time the word that's, that means to be saved, the, the Greek word, in the English, about half the time it's rendered as you have been made well, mm. i.e. you got your, your sight back or you got uh, the flow of blood, right? And about half the time it's rendered as, in the English, saved. And therefore, we, we, and it says, by your faith you have been saved. But in other cases, it says, by your faith you have been made well. Part of what that says to us is, is that salvation is a holistic concept that is a here and now kind of concept. Because the other thing we have to take note of is, those healings that Jesus offered that, that gave salvation to those people, it happened before the cross. Yeah. It happened before the resurrection. It happened before he completed and fulfilled his mission. And so you have to ask yourself, oh, well, so w- what does all that mean? And for a Christian who, you know, as, as, as one so-called, I say, you know, uh, w- I need Jesus to suffer and die, and I need Jesus to enter that tomb, and I need Jesus to be raised from that tomb, and all of that is important. But also know that he healed and even offered resurrection, as you know, from Lazarus and, and a couple of others, actually, before he went to the cross and before he was raised from the dead. And he therefore gave salvation to them before that. And that salvation was about get, being gifted something in their lifetime for their life, mm. not just for a reservation at a nice place after I die, right? That's the, that's the interesting part about Jesus being the only way is um, he is the way to that salvation, and he is the way to that abundant life, and he is the way to the truth that God really is love and wants us to love. Um, well, and I think that one of the things that we get wrong in all of that, which so many things we get wrong, but one of them is thinking, um, spreading the message of Jesus is the way is about uh, persuading others into believing something. Mm. And it sounds like that's not what it is at all. It's about taking 
on the lifestyle of Jesus for yourself and exuding Christ's love to others. And it's not about talking them into anything. And I think that's the bad taste that us Christians leave in people's mouths is like, yeah, you're constantly trying to sell me on something and you don't care about me. Like you don't care about being my friend and being in relationship with me. All you're trying to do is save my soul for when life is done. Yeah. Yeah. And you're absolutely right. And that, that gets a bad name because that's all about racking up notches on a belt or whatever. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and again, where you think about the way in which Jesus offered himself as the way and the truth and the life to people, some of those I just mentioned, and obviously many others, he was doing it simply and solely because he loved them. And he was just demonstrating love to them. Now, he clearly had, you know, some capacity that we don't have, but um, he did it not to earn them a place, not to uh, create a, a, a counting mechanism for things he could chalk up, right? He did it simply and solely because he loved them, because that's his command, right? His command is that we love people just like he loved us. That's our goal. Yeah. Well, I am curious to know... Um, your thoughts around the ideology, all paths lead to God. (laughs) Um, Because I am especially curious now, because again, when I wrote these questions, I was like, oh, I bet I know what answer he's going to give to all of these. And again, you have taken me down a totally different path. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think that's a bunch of bunk. You do? Yes, I do. Not all paths lead to to Jesus, or what? What was the question? All paths, all lead, paths to God. lead to God. Not all paths lead to God. I mean, that would be like saying, uh, uh, "So does does the worship of Satan lead to God?" I mean, does the worship of uh, wealth and and commercialism lead to God? No. Does uh, are there some world religions that we all, that we've already claimed? Or do they have ways to God? I believe they do. But to say that all religions are the same or to say that all religions lead to God, I don't believe that. I mean, likewise, we've seen, quote unquote, in the name of Jesus, things like the Koreshians, right? And by golly, uh, and going way before your time, the, the, the Jonesville massacre, you know, um, those were people who in the name of Jesus, supposedly, were trying to lead people to God. Do I believe that path led to Jesus or God? No, I don't. So... Mm-hmm. For me, the short answer, even though it wasn't a short answer, <laughs> is all paths don't lead to God. They don't. What about um, do like all uh, truths with a capital T of the different faiths? Can we say those all lead lead to God? I, I if bel- it's not perverted or distorted in any way, <laughs> if, it's, if it's not a part of the human condition, you mean? Well, I mean, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, so in theory, the answer to, for me, the answer to your question is yes, because I, I believe that Judaism and Islam and Buddhism and Hinduism and perhaps a few others have pathways to an enlightenment or to a, to a higher power or to a god, uh, in the Hindu case, multiple gods. Um, it's not my path, it's not my way, but I'm not going to condemn them or somehow say that they are wrong or... Uh, that they're on a bad path. Now, um, if in conversation with friends who who have f- other faith traditions, we talk about our faith, and by golly, if after a time they might want to know more about Jesus in a way that could transform who they are or what they think, I'm, I'm all into that, and I'm all for that. But my conversations about my relationship with Jesus with my buddy who's a Hindu or a Muslim is not about conversion, It's about simply sharing my truth and my faith, just like I want to hear and understand their truth and their faith as well. I was going to ask if you, with those friendships, if you do have curiosities, if you're like, hey, tell me more about Muhammad. I I want to better know him. I want to better understand him. Yes, absolutely. Right. I think that's the beauty. And I, I think, you know, somebody may kick me out as a heretic for saying this, but I think Paul himself would have said something along those lines. Paul was very good, the Apostle Paul, uh, who wrote the letters in the New Testament. Um, A part of Paul's brilliance was to be able to speak his truth about faith in Jesus and the way to people who had other faith traditions. And he did it in such a way that he helped them to see either I want to follow this way or I don't, right? Right. 
Um, I forget the chapter in Acts. I want to say it's chapter 18 or 19. But he walks into to Athens in Greece, and he, he sort of enters into a conversation with a bunch of people and says, hey, I, I see you guys are pretty religious here. I see you guys really have, because there were temples to everything, right? I mean, there were just temples for all kinds of deities and uh, other gods. And he basically says, I, in fact, I noticed you've got this uh, 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 monument to an unknown god. Because, you know, golly, if we're going to have, you know, Zeus and, and Poseidon and all these others, we surely ought to have one to an unknown God, right? Mm-hmm. And that, it's at that point that um, he said, well, so I want to tell you about that unknown God. And then he shared about his understanding of God and Jesus. And, and uh, I, I just think we have got to get to a point where we're willing to hear people and listen to what they have to share with regard to their faith um, again, out of love and kindness, not out of an ulterior motive to con- convert. Mm. By the way, I, I'm into conversion, and I want people to come to follow Jesus, but I'm going to worry more about the 65% of people in our area and around the world who have no faith claim than about my Muslim brothers and sisters or my Jewish brothers and sisters. I, 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 there are plenty of other fish in the sea to tell about Jesus than somebody who already has a faith claim. Well, and, and I want to talk about that a little bit too, because, um, you know, atheism might be the biggest religion in the world. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, it is, it, it's odd to say, but I do think atheism is a spiritual practice in and of <laughs> itself. Um, and I, I wonder about that. Um, if someone says, I do not believe that there is a higher power, I believe that there is science and we are just organisms on a floating rock and it's all happenstance, it's all random. And yet they're living this loving, caring life and caring for their neighbors and giving to the poor and helping the needy among them. Who am I to say that they're not living the way? Well, that's that, that was sort of my point before is, Again, if people are living the way of Jesus, the things we've talked about, again, you know, mercy and justice and forgiveness and love and compassion and kindness and all of those things, if they're living that way, then you're right. Who am I to judge, number one? And because the second part is not only who am I to judge, but nobody knows that person's heart other than them and whether they're agnostic or atheist or God, right? I mean, nobody knows their heart. But what I do know is God wants everybody to be saved. And in this case, that salvation is about how we offer this healing and wholeness that Jesus was about, and in particular in the confines of the gift of unconditional love. And so, yeah, do I believe there are agnostics and atheists who can live that way? I do. Mm-hmm. I think a, a new way, maybe not new, but... Um, you know, we keep saying Jesus is a way. And I wonder if one of the new forming new world ways is self-care, um, is learning about mental health and learning how to better care for ourselves and accept ourselves and love ourselves and love each other as a result of that. It it feels to me like there's something in that. There's this new emergence happening right now of learning to care about ourselves and the world around us beyond what we can produce um, in this capitalistic, you know, commercial society that we live in. And I'm wondering, like, is that a way that God is trying to connect with us? Uh, I, I, is it a way? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, again, Jesus, you know, boiled everything down to two things, right? Love God with your whole heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And we can't love our neighbor, whoever our neighbor is unless we first love ourselves, right? And so there is a truth to we've got to take care of our own emotional and mental and spiritual health as well as our physical health so that we can love our neighbors and help them in whatever way we can. Do you think that the idea of um, Jesus as the way could create inclusivity or um, exclusivity in any way? Like... (laughs) Are we, are we pushing people away with this idea? Well, I think that we can, right? And certainly I've seen it, I can only assume you've seen it, where we've pushed people away by saying, well, clearly if you don't claim faith in Jesus, you're going to hell. 
or you'll never make it to heaven, Mm -hmm. or um, you're not, I mean, this is extreme in my opinion, as if the others aren't, but you're not worthy of my time and energy, and I'm basically, you're a lost cause. That's exclusivity to the nth degree, and clearly Jesus would not be about that at, at all. On the other hand, and, and yet there is this distinguish, uh, this uh, distinction rather of Jesus as the Son of God, uh, the Savior of the world. We believe, and uh, if we choose to follow Him as our Lord, we believe that He's Lord over everything, not just over our lives. We believe He's Lord of all, and so there's a clear peculiarity and a distinctiveness about Jesus, and yet. Um, I happen to believe that a part of the way of Jesus and the truth of Jesus is that he's available to anybody and he's available to all. Uh, but there, there's this thing called faith, right? And this thing called faith says, um, I've got to, if I'm going to follow who you are, Jesus, I've got to claim you as Lord and follow you as Savior. Now, I can do those, I can follow the way, your teachings, without claiming you as Lord. Mm-hmm. Um, but if I, this would be my, my follow-up faith claim. If you want the fullest of life, if you want um, the greatest of truth, then you're going to claim him as Lord and follow him as Savior. Um, I don't say that to say anybody who doesn't is like condemned or anything. I just say, I have found in my own life that when I claim him as Lord and follow him as Savior, that it changes who I am. It changes how I act. It changes what I do. Uh, and I think it's worthy. And I think it's worthy of the way and the truth and the life. Do you think that, because I think it's safe to say, you've made a career out of this Jesus guy, <laughs> right? <laughs> Which is an odd way to put it. But I don't know if it's a career, but yeah, my life is, is there, yeah. Do you think that we have a full understanding of who Jesus was and what that means for us? No. I, I think that that's sort of the ultimate abundant life and everlasting life is knowing him in the fullest sense. And do I believe that that happens in a life after this? I do. Mm -hmm. But, and I don't have a clue what that's like. Uh, But my goal as a follower of Jesus is to try to reach the language we use in the Wesleyan tradition is perfection. And it's a horrible word, but because it has all kinds of baggage about without fault and without sin and all that kind of stuff. But that's not what it means. Perfect love, as God is perfect love, is that I can love others the way God loves me. And that that's what I'm striving after, and that that ultimately builds the kingdom of God. Until I reach that, whether in this life or the next, I I can't fully know Jesus. I can't. I can strive after him. I can spend time with him. I can uh, talk to him in prayer. I can read about him in Scripture. I can see his life teaching in other people. I can hopefully, obviously, emulate it. Um, But no, I don't think we fully know Jesus. Mm -hmm. Well, Well, my last question around all of this what do you think is at the root of this question? Is Jesus really the only way? Because we have so many people typing this question into Google, trying to figure it out. Why do you think people are asking this so predominantly? Yeah, well, I think it's probably for two primary reasons. One is a genuine desire to know truth, right? Just, golly, is this true, right? And then I think the other is we live in such a world that we have neighbors, friends, co-workers, family members who are either of other faith traditions or no faith tradition, i.e. agnostic or atheist. And we want it because we love them. We want to know, are, are they condemned to hell? Are they not going to find some kind of fulfillment in life? Are they never going to find salvation? I think the, I think the irony, based on our previous conversation, is... Um, People, people want to love. I believe that. And in so loving, they want to do the right thing. And so they want to know what, what is the right thing if Jesus is the only way? Mm-hmm. And what, what are the ramifications of that? And then um, how do I respond to the people I love? Mm-hmm. Right? That, to me, that's why people are asking. Yeah, I, I think that there's a lot of fear around it. Um, of 
like you said, what does this mean for the people that I love? What does this mean for me? What does this mean for how I live my life? Like, yeah. what if I haven't lived my life as if Jesus is the way, yeah. you know? And I think that there's a lot of anxiety around mm -hmm. this question, but it feels like what we're kind of saying today is uh, Jesus is a way and is a really good way right. to connect with God, but it's okay. Like, take a breath. Yeah, Everything's going to be okay. It's not my way. Or, God is not my way or the highway kind of, well, I don't know. Maybe God is. I don't know. Well, so again, a, 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 the, what I reflect on based on, you know, what you're sharing is, again, I always want to go back to Jesus himself and the ways in which he encountered people. And when he, so when you read the Gospels, you see Jesus encountering people in essentially, in sort of at the base level, in one of two ways. For those who do not know love or have not felt wholeness or don't don't know a, a, a salvation, he is gracious and kind and merciful and just and forgiving. But for those who think they know it all and have it all together and have all the religiosity uh, sort of buttoned up, he's ticked off mm. because they're living in such a way that isn't loving and kind and gracious and merciful and compassionate, right? And so I choose to say, golly, if Jesus encounters people who don't know him yet, and he encounters people who haven't professed faith in him yet, and he encounters people who know nothing of the God that he is of, and he does it with love, mercy, and compassion, that, that's how I need to interface with people, right? Because I'm his father. Thanks, Daniel. I think that's about the best we're going to be able to do. Yeah, thanks so much. <laughs> Tough topic, but a good one. The Life Plus God podcast is hosted, written, and produced by me, Alyssa Robinson, and sponsored by Treach Memorial United Methodist Church in Flower Mound, Texas. If you live in the Flower Mound area, I invite you to stop by and see if Treach could be your new church family. You can learn more about all of our programs and events at tmumc.org, and I hope to catch you next week for our next episode of the Life Plus God podcast.